The question of resource efficiency and resilience in that term, I think, is an inevitable one. We can't go around that if we want to achieve these goals around the globe on a European level, on a national level, on a local level, that's where we have to put the focus. One thing that I hope we will achieve is that we will get everyone on board, as I said, all the professionals as well as on a social level, everyone. Hello everyone and welcome to FutureX, a podcast by Martin Hearn, Event Director, FutureBuild and co-host Dr. Oliver Jones, Research Director, Rider Architecture. FutureX will bring together some of the brightest minds and some of the most disruptive thinkers and innovators to transform the construction industry and build a FutureX community of like-minded people that can begin to make a real change. We really hope you enjoy the series. Hello and welcome to FutureX. I'm Martin Hearn, Event Director at FutureBuild and I'm joined by Dr. Oliver Jones. Oliver, this week's guest is one of our Net Zero Pioneers series. Um, a lady called Lesbeth Tenneman. She's from Brussels and the managing director at CERAA. She's an architect, researcher, and a bream assessor. And I mean, they are doing some amazing things in in Brussels. I think um, I was super excited to speak to these guys, um, particularly after hearing about all the great work that Brussels are doing. I mean, Brussels for their size as well. Wow, they're punching above their weight in terms of whole city retrofit approach to sustainability and future strategies. I was blown away by um, what they presented around whole city retrofit at Future Build. And Pascal Schmidt, their Secretary of State for Construction, uh, really enigmatic guy, talks incredibly enthusiastically, but more importantly, is a phenomenal political leader in terms of um, pushing, really driving through an approach to sustainability, a citywide approach to sustainability that is has a long-term vision. I think what stood out about um, Lisbeth and and the company that she works for is that these guys have been going for 15 years. You know, these guys solidly fall into the net zero veterans of Bill Dunster and Tom Wally that we've talked about before. So it's really interesting that they've been operating as a research organization that they spun out of a university, but they are now having such a huge impact on the future sustainability strategy are in a really progressive city like Brussels. Absolutely. And I think Lisbeth has quite a unique role as well, really. You know, they sit as almost an advisory group to architects who are trying to navigate the really quite stringent and, well, in a positive sense, very uh, forward thinking environmental policies that Brussels have brought in. I mean, they've been building to passive house standards to 20, from 2015. Yeah, they've got some amazing new laws coming into place around uh, resolution um, strategy around not being able to create any flat roof that doesn't have a, a green roof on it, you know, around not being able to demolish and always looking to renovate and or refurbish retrofit buildings first. So they're definitely leading the way. Anyone that's listening at the minute, take a look at what Brussels are doing because I think it's it's super exciting and we could learn an awful lot here in the UK uh, from their approach. And just what a lovely woman to talk to uh, who's been really a sustainable a sustainability advocate for so long. Absolutely. Well, let's get her on. Hi, Elizabeth. Great to have you on the podcast. Good morning. <laughs> We've been looking forward to this one because I know that you are really heavily linked into circularity and all things net zero and sustainability. For the listeners, as usual, let's kick off with a bit of background to yourself. I come from Belgium. It's a very small country on the other side of the channel you might have heard about. <laughs> <laughs> and I live in Brussels. I came to Brussels for my studies. I studied architecture. I also work as an architect besides the consultancy that we do at CERA. And when I finished university, I did my internship in a big architect firm where for two years I mainly spent time doing corrections on on building drawings and I never met the client so that was very frustrating and then I got an opportunity to work as a project manager as a for a bank and they were just starting to to put together a team that was going to work on sustainability 
So I volunteered because I was very interested in this. And the coincidence was that during this work for the sustainability team, I went to a conference which was organized by Sera, the company I am currently CEO of, about sustainable building. I kept in contact and one day I got a phone call from the former director who asked if I was interested in joining because they were looking to expand the team. And I went in because sustainability in the built environment has always been a big issue for me. I had a lot of questions because when you roll out of university, you more or less have an idea about what this means, but how do I integrate this into projects? And also because I believe that, I've always believed that when you are an architect, every line you draw will define a space within which people will live, they will work, they will walk, they will sit, they will sing, they will sleep, anything. And all these lines and the actions that follow of building, renovating, repurposing, reimagining, they all spill out into the public realm. So we shape the environment in which we all live and we all evolve. And that's a huge responsibility. I'm not saying that we should feel guilty about anything, but it's a huge opportunity to do things right. And doing things right would mean that we should try to do it right when we decide to tap into the planetary resources that we have. They are not indefinite. We can't consider them to be. So that's a big issue. And we are in a unique position to act on that and to do things differently. I couldn't agree more, Lisbeth. I think we, as an industry, architecture is perpetually struggling with this situation and its own identity in that we are frequently having conversations around beauty and aesthetics, which, to be honest, frustrate the hell out of me because if it's functional and it's doing the right thing for people on the planet then it's inherently beautiful in itself it's got very little to do with individual egos or aesthetics that are being pushed at the minute in the world of architecture so i think there's a huge transition that's going on at the moment there and i think that everything you've just articulated so well it's just it's, it's so on the money with regards to what architecture should really be about so Sarah and where you're at now, tell us a bit more about Sarah. Sarah is a small company. We're actually a non-profit. Our team is currently nine people. One ex exception, exception sorry, aside, we're all architects. So we all work as an architect also alongside the work we do at Sarah. So we are a consultancy non-profit, which is an exception. I'll get back to that later. Specializing in sustainable building and renovation, which is a very short way of condensing a whole array of thematics and complex questions. Why are we a non-profit? Historically, the company was founded as a research center of one of the universities in Brussels, the architecture department. And at one point with the whole Bologna reform in higher education, we had to choose either the university would absorb Sera and we would lose the name and the specificity. Either we decided to go, continue on ourselves and we decided as a team to do this, but we kept the initial mission statement, which has always been and still is. All the research and consultancy we do should profit to the largest number possible. So we don't work for private companies. The things we do when we teach, when we advise, when we organize conferences, when we develop tools or calculation methods, they are they are destined to be publicly available so our main our clients are exclusively public authorities going from that's this is a big client of ours the brussels environmental administration up to the belgian federal level for some specific projects and we have also recently been invited as experts by the european commission to assess projects under the horizon 2022 call i think You've touched on something there. You guys were a spin out years ago from a university, which I think yep. is amazing. There's a couple of things that, that I know about Sarah, and it, one of them is that spin out angle. I think it's an amazing, interesting relationship that was well before its time in terms of a spin out with a university into industry and into being a nonprofit and, and being able to engage with such an important conversation 15 years ago. The other is that you guys give an awful lot of technical teaching and CPD, as we call it in the UK, to, to developing professionals, don't you? And from what I understand, that also started 15 years ago, to a large extent. And that is way ahead of its time. We grapple in this country, in the UK, with an awful lot of 
issues around culture and behaviors. And it sounds Brussels was really getting to grips with behaviors and culture 15 years ago by just making all of these professionals focus on extending their professional knowledge in environmental space. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I also have to be honest. This is not thanks to us. This is especially thanks to the Brussels Regions and Environmental Administration and hence the government, because there's a budget for this. Have so really it was government-led then, at least better. The, oh. Let's say the movement as in itself, yes, to roll back a little bit. Where were we when I, in Brussels, when I joined CERA 15 years ago? The main issue regarding sustainable building at the time was building performance and the fact that in Brussels, they were planning on rolling out a sort of equivalent of the passive house standard. It's a little bit different, but I won't get into the details. So energy obviously was a big issue. That was the case in a lot of member countries of the European Union because of the EPB directive. But I don't know who actually was responsible for this, but thousands of thanks to him or her somewhere at some point somewhere in the brussels political sphere someone said maybe we should broaden this and go for a wider sense of sustainable building and we have a lot to do because we should support and help professionals to get into the movement and to enable them to tackle these issues so they decided to roll out a couple of projects one of them is one that we've been doing for 15 years, which is a service which is called the Sustainable Building Facilitator. So anyone who is doing a professional, so a construction company, a designer, an engineering firm, a project developer, anyone who is having a project in Brussels, renovation or new build, and has questions regarding any thematic that has to do with sustainability in the built environment, can contact us for help. That can go from help with the calculation to a more broad question towards help with defining uh, tender documents and so on. And the questions, the number of questions has just been going up over these 15 years. Uh, that's phenomenal. I think, so at the show, we presented called the 100 year plan. And actually the, that was all about short term political cycles and the issues with short term political cycles, particularly with regards to sustainability roadmaps and changing accelerating us towards net zero. But it sounds like in Brussels that you guys have managed to just maintain this emphasis throughout different political regimes on the, having the right kind of funding in the right place at the right time for that professional work, which, I mean, we could learn an awful lot from that. And where you described the market being in, in Brussels 15 years ago by talking about should we or should we not engage with Passive House, to a large extent, I feel that's exactly where we are with our government today in the built environment and in construction, we're having that conversation 15 years too late, or, or we're even having it again. So, you, so that I think we could learn an awful lot from you guys on that. You, what kind of trends have you noticed then over this 15 year period? I think 15 years ago, the main preoccupations of most of the building professionals were linked to energy performance of buildings. We have something in, in the Brussels region, which I think put us on the map internationally at one point, and which probably contributed to uh, the fact that the support from the political level hasn't diminished. There's always a risk, of course, when you're linked to politics, that at one point you have another party who will say, this isn't important for me, I'm going to size this down. This hasn't happened. Why? I think because we have been having a lot of international delegations coming to visit what we call exemplary buildings. So this was a contest which was launched in 2012, where people could apply. They had a project, renovation or new builds. There was an assessment. It's not a BREAM assessment, but it's across the same thematics. And if they, let's say, if they hit the mark that the project was considered sustainable through all the thematics, there was also an important financial support. So there was an, at the time, we were talking about 100 euros per square meter budget. And this kickstarted a lot of projects which have been, let's say, interesting to international delegations. So we got a lot of visitors, we did guided tours. And we had articles in the press and so on. So I think the fact that this went quite quickly over a couple of years 
politically, probably they understood on the Belgian, on the Brussels level, sorry, at least, that it would be a bad idea to stop this movement because it was engaging. But I have to say, 15 years ago, the first projects that we had, with, which still had a big energy focus, I think somewhere we might have missed an opportunity at that point, but okay, we were doing better now. The first passive buildings that we had in Brussels, we also had the the first biggest passive office building in Europe, for example. But some of them were built in, in with, let's say, the traditional way, so concrete blocks with cement mortar or concrete walls, and then we could put glue insulation on there, and we would have a wall plaster, and that's it. You look at these projects, which are about 15 years old today, in terms of circularity or reversibility, their score is very bad. You can't just easily change them. You generate a lot of waste. It's not reversible. So in terms of urban mining, there's no potential. So because of the push for the building performance and the fact that we probably weren't ready, not only in Brussels, but probably all over Europe with, let's hold on a minute, what are we going to do with our materials and how are we going to build these in terms of resources? Somewhere, maybe we little, went a little bit too quick and we should have integrated other issues as well. I guess back in, let's say back in the day, but let's say 10 years ago, there was, a, there was an understanding that we can't keep using virgin raw materials. But I guess we're more acutely aware now of yeah. the impact of that and also the value of the materials that we've already got. It's almost... We're operating thinking that materials, we have a never-ending supply of materials and there'll always be a never-ending supply of materials. But there's a lot of things at play at the minute now, isn't there? There's the carbon border adjustment mechanism that's coming into play in Europe and currently only on sort of things like concrete and steel and fertilizer. But it's really easy to see how that's going to be applied other construction materials over time. And you guys probably know an awful lot more about this than me, but that tends to do funny things to markets. They'll I imagine a lot of the materials that are produced within Europe, within the European Union, will stay within the European Union because there's a, an emphasis and an added incentive, which means that they'll be more expensive to people outside of the European Union because they'll be in shorter supply. So the, it's a really interesting moving feast of parts to watch in terms of how is the UK tackling its material supply? How are we preparing? which I think at the minute the answer is we're not, for not being able to get all of the European bricks that we'd previously supplemented our own manufacturer bricks with. And should we be much more quickly moving towards a circular approach and reduce, reduction of waste? And as you've talked about in the past, urban mining, which is something we'll get onto. The trends that you've recognized there, Lisbeth, are, are totally in line with everything that we would usually talk about on the podcast. Are, I guess one of the things that I really wanted to pull on was the work that you've done with Brussels specifically around circularity and be becoming Europe's first circular city in, in, in some senses. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of things happening in the field of circular building and renovation in the Brussels region. I would say that the issue has always been part of the holistic assessment that has been done in the Brussels region regarding sustainability, but it really kick-started, I would say, around five years ago when the administration started to do to map the region in terms of developing a regional circular economy plan. So that applies to other sectors than the building sector as well. There's food involved, fashion, transport, but there is a really big chapter on building. And there was a tender we replied to when we got the project to assist the environmental administration for two years in doing this mapping and then defining the priority actions to roll out to get a view on what were the difficulties, what was missing, what the opportunities were. So it was very interesting to do. For example, we have, and you probably bumped into one of their books already. I saw the one at the book once at the book stands in Future Build. We have a company in Brussels, which is called Rotor. So Rotor, which also linked, obviously, with the logo as well to circularity. And they've been, let's say, the main player in terms of reuse of building materials. So they go to construction sites and they take away materials and they resell them. 
and the, their business has been booming. And one of the main issues was we don't have a place to, let's say, store all this because we're in the Brussels region, which is very densely built and let's say industrial plots with big warehouses, which are empty. We don't have them. So we have to try and find solutions to avoid that these materials end up somewhere else far away. And this for example, was one concrete action for the circular economy plan was to help them to find this solution for logistics. It's just one example. We did the mapping on what is in the teaching for people who work in the building sector, for the architects, for the companies, for the people who go work for construction companies. In what way is circularity already integrated? Is it or not? If it isn't, how could we do? So we tried to map out a five-year plan to integrate this also into teaching. We were looking at projects that were actually already doing something in terms of circularity, but weren't recognized as such to try to put them on the map. So you have a specific website also, which is called Be Circular. <laughs> B because it's a BE, but B, let's Be Circular in English, it works as well, where you can have a look at all the pilot projects that at some point also benefited from assistance and or financial support, where you can see multiple examples of, let's say, for re reuse of tons of bricks, reuse of interior materials like floorboards, walls, and so on, sanitary fittings. So there's a big database where you can witness this, and you can also still enroll in the call for financing your project where you have to prove that you are really doing something regarding circularity. I should also mention that we have construction confederation in, in the Brussels region, and also the cluster EcoBuild, which are also very big on sharing this knowledge, putting stakeholders into contact with each other, showcasing projects through videos to conferences, through visits. And that's, I think that's probably what also makes that it work so well, because everyone is really involved in sharing and connecting to get every, for everyone on the road towards the goal. We could have had, and I'm glad we didn't, an approach where, let's say, oh, I'm very happy. What, me as a company, I'm very circular. I'm going to keep all my secrets to myself and I'm going to position my one in, myself in the market as the go-to partner because I'm the best. Some try to do this, but the main tendency is that people really share their experiences and they build on them. And there's a lot of events during the day, in the weekend, at night, where you can go and just share and talk to each other and reflect on it. And that's, it's, it's really, it's bubbling. It's great. Everyone wants to learn and everyone is very conscious that no one has the perfect solution. So that's very good. I think maybe in some way that's because we're Belgian. Had we been French, maybe we wouldn't have done it that way. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. It's a small what joke it? towards the neighboring Shot country. Shot across but... the bow. <laughs> that... <laughs> Lisbeth, it sounds like you bought Duncan Baker Brown's book, The Reuse Atlas, at Future Build. He talks heavily about Rota and obviously the work of very yeah. people in Brussels. A question for me is, is, how is the government driving this agenda? We talk a lot on this podcast about both the positive side and negative side of regulations and different targets being set, etc. How does that work in Brussels? What we now have, which is starting to be rolled out, is Renolution, which is, let's say, the extended approach of the building energy performance regulation, which obviously we can't avoid, which has been implemented. Renolution is now the new Brussels region's policy, where the aim is obviously to reduce energy demand substantially by 2050 with different steps along this trajectory. And there's also a link with subsidies for this. If you buy or sell a building you will obviously that this has been going on for uh, some time you your reference is the energy performance certificate and there are different dates from which your building that you're putting on the market should have at least a given performance according to the energy performance certificate and it's quite severe we really have to step things up so if you now renovate a building because it's mainly an issue of renovation in Brussels. 85% of building permits are renovation projects. We don't have a lot of new buildings. We do have some, but obviously we don't have a lot of vacant building plots. So the main issue is renovation. You have to renovate to a very high degree of building energy performance. So for that, you can get financial aid. 
And if you do this on top of this with materials which are from reuse and or bio-based, and you can also add they are put into place in a reversible way to allow them to serve a future other project, your fine level of subsidy goes up. So you can be ambitious in terms of circularity and the administration will help you by giving you extra money for this, to put it very simply. That doesn't mean you not investing anything yourself, but you get an envelope that helps you because they want to make sure that this renovation wave, which is also, there's also a European renovation wave on the way, that we can do this as resource efficient as possible. So if so, you want so to, a, you get extra help. There's a huge focus then on on retrofit in, in what you talk about here. And if I've read that right, Elizabeth, the subsidies from local authorities or local government in terms of development scale, not only how energy optimal energy performing the building is, for want of a better phrase, but also for the level of performance that you're going to achieve, the level of disassembly that you're going to achieve. So however ambitious your env environmental targets are, the local government will give you money and the higher subsidy for that as well. I, it sounds absolutely brilliant in terms of a, an approach. I've got so many questions. So one of, imagine just for a second, imagine a future or imagine a present in the UK where there is no plan, there is an immature supply chain, there are no real logistics in place for supporting a circular economy, and the concept of urban mining and or circularity is in, in its infancy in terms of being applied, but has been talked about and defined an awful lot. I couldn't possibly say that's our current state of play in the UK, but it's very close. You mentioned before all of these little moves that have been made, the industry groups, the circularity groups that come together, the conversations that are going on. In the really simple terms, just for the UK to get started, for the industry to get moving on the UK becoming more circular, what would your sort of top tips be? Because you're a big ask, but you're definitely the most experienced person that I've talked to having done this for the last 15 years, what have Brussels done that you can learn from? What should the UK be looking to do in terms of setting up industry groups, in terms of next moves for circularity? I have an idea about what I'm going to ask, but I'm a bit afraid that it might create a diplomatic incident. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely want that answer, so let's go with it. Yeah, absolutely. No, because yeah. I'm, I know, let's say, your country across the channel, I know it quite well, but I'm not an expert on how actually the mechanics of politics really works. So I'm going to say in a, from my, my Brussels unicorn, I think if you want to get things rolling, you really need your public authorities to get into it with support, trying to facilitate things as much as possible in terms of accompanying the sector with things that are put in place to help them, like things that we had in Brussels. Is there a place where you can ask questions and it's free because the facilitator we have here, it's free, it's oh, financed. Oh. And I think also a financial push or help because if you're not in the movement yet ex some exceptions aside on average it's going to cost more money because yeah. you can't just consider especially today i don't know think you should ever consider that yeah of course we will we are all able to put this extra money on the table as a construction company or as a designer or as a project developer it's not and if you, we want to get everything on board because this sustainability is also something i wanted to say Something we shouldn't forget either is that there's also an important social component. We have the United Nations Sustainability Indicators, where we should strive. And inclusion, getting everyone on board, is a big one. So we, if we want to avoid that sustainable renovation and construction, including circularity, but also the other thematics, is something that's going to be for the happy few, we're taking the wrong road. We're not going to tackle this planetary resources issue if it's only for those who can afford it. So. If you want to get a big movement and get everything on board and have as equal opportunities as possible in terms of achieving these goals, I think you need your, I call it public authorities, but you probably have an idea about who could do this where you are. 
you get you need to get them in but i don't know if the model about if the model for the construction sector and the public sector and the way they're linked in great britain is makes this possible but i think you need public investment definitely so this is let's just say for example for one moment that if by chance uk government and local authorities hadn't really got a clue and that there's an issue with the level of knowledge and expertise around circularity at that level in being able to put a plan together if we were going to put a few things on the table that would make a massive difference to our journey in terms of circularity in the uk if i'm getting it right from you this is looking at how we tax in sorry incentivize retrofit projects looking at how we might tax demolition and waste potentially further and in also supplying funding for a huge learning program that runs alongside that for industry as well is there anything else you'd throw in the mix for any of the many politicians that listen to the podcast i think you quite you summarize it it very well if i would imagine if we hadn't had that in brussels where would we be today it's difficult to say but 15 years ago, it's not that there was, nothing was happening. We've all, always had, and you have them as well, what we call front runners, people who have been into sustainability really hardcore sometimes. And I find that very interesting because they experiment with a lot of things. So we had projects that check all the boxes for sustainability because either there was a very ambitious client who was really willing to go the extra mile or a designer who really had the principles as a basis and who designed the project but we never would have had the movement that we've had and which makes that what we are where we are today there's still a yeah. lot of work to be done and huh? don't think that we've solved everything the resolution and everything that goes with this we have to go i think the way they're taking with the financing for example and all the support and all the project calls and so on are very useful and absolutely necessary but Sometimes I wonder, but this isn't linked to Brussels, how are we going to manage this renovation wave on a European level, given the massive work that lays ahead? We have 25 years, something about that, left to reach these objectives. Will we do it? I want to believe that we do, but it's going to be a very hard one because in terms mm -hmm. of resources, as you said, these building materials, I think that's one of the main reasons why we have to look at urban mining and trying to do with what we already have. Because if we all massively in the whole of Europe or all over the world need to start bump, need to start vamping up building performance, we're going to need such a huge amount of materials that I don't think we, we live on this globe. You have some people who believe that the earth is flat. I don't. It's, it's a globe. It's finite, so we really need to go this circular way, otherwise we won't get all the resources. So that's a big one. And so I think if they should focus on getting the movement started, that circularity absolutely has to be in there. It's non-negotiable, non-negotiable, otherwise we won't get there. And one of the things that really strikes me about that is that it does require that international systemic change. And that's something that Indy spoke about recently on the podcast is it does require that because otherwise what we end up having is uh, is almost tax havens or circularity havens dotted around Europe where large build large new builds big headquarters say we're not going to build over in the UK because they've got all these laws and standards and certifications around us having to reuse materials which is going to cost us more money so we'll go to X and we'll build there instead so there's a real interesting need as a globally and this is something that the i know the world green building council is looking at in in how do we create that sy systemic approach to circularity across across the world one of the things i wanted to pick up with you on there Elizabeth, is to talk about reclaiming materials urban mining and you guys have been in this space for such a long time digital disruptions clearly been happening at a rate of knots in the last five years how are material passports starting to play an issue, a part of this? How are we tracking where these materials are coming from and where they go? And is this creating somewhat of a golden thread of information around material origin and material sourcing that also follows through to 
information about recycling and reuse further down the line. Is that something you're seeing over in Brussels? Yes, the material passports are an important component, of course. Uh, the thing is that it's too early to say if it will bear the fruit that we would like it to bear because it's just starting to be put in place. It, I would be very happy to take, let's say, five minutes and time travel 30 or 50 years into the future to see how the, pe the people who are looking at the material passport from a project of 30 or 50 years ago are handling it. But it's an, a very important issue, and in, it's, not, it's not mandatory here yet, but it probably will be become. In, in, in the Brussels region, when something becomes an obligation, what they usually do is first, the tools are developed to allow people to do it. For example, an inventory before you carry out any renovation work in a building, there's a model available, please use it if you need to use it and you don't know how, we will help you. And then a couple of years down the road, they make it mandatory. So they, let's say, make it available. People who want to engage with it can use it. There's assistance. And then at some point, you have to do it. It's so, very probable that it will be integrated into building permits, but we're not talking two years. I think it's further down the road. But in a lot of public tender projects for, let's say, competitions for building a new administration building, or a new building for the fire brigade. We see these, we help these authorities with their documents and they are more and more integrating the, um, the obligation to provide building material passports. Usually they're linked to building information modeling also. Uh, so what, is it, what do they look like at the moment, Lisbeth, in Brussels? So we've, we've got lots of pipe dreams around what building material passports might do and might look like it in, in action. I feel like they're being applied and asked for and requested in proposals an awful lot more in Brussels. On the ground, it might not be in every circumstance, obviously, but what are material passports in Brussels? We, to say it simply, currently we have two versions. We have the simpler version, which is coming from a sustainable building tool, which is applicable on a Belgian level. Let's say it's our bream, but it's not with the cost of a bream assessor. It's voluntary. And it's for free. Uh, there you have a simplified version, which is currently an Excel sheet that you fill in with the whole set of materials in your projects. And then there's a whole lot of columns with characteristics. For example, the recycled content, where this comes from, the way it was assembled, what uh, is it from renew, renew, renewable, sorry, resources or not? Is there an eco label? If yes, which one? Is there a certificate like FSC or PFC? Which one? And so on. Mm -hmm. So this is like an inventory of your materials. And then you're supposed to add to this all the technical documentation of the materials once they have been put in place. That's the simplified version, which exists because we really need to realize that it's not, not every designer is working with the building information modeling. For smaller projects, this isn't still isn't necessarily the way to do things. For bigger ones, yes, but for smaller ones, not all designers work with BIM. Probably this will change, but it's not for for everyone. And then you have obviously, let's say, the Rolls Royce version, where you have I can't say I can't state any brands of of software, but where you have everything which is integrated into your software model, where you can link your layers and your components with the technical info and which is supposed to end up in a neatly organized box with all the information about all the materials that you have in there. And someone can take these 30 years down the road and have a look at what you put into your building. That's quite complex. I know this is starting. It's been some projects, some designers have been doing this, especially the big offices for the last two years. But I don't know in detail how difficult or easy it is for them to do this. So that's an, a good issue. Maybe we should try to get some feedback on how easy is it to do this and how, a lot, the, how much work is it. But it's an essential component, I think, in terms of circularity, because this is one of the main problems. We're in this transition period where we still have these issues with, for example, Rotor, who sells secondhand building materials. You want to integrate them into a project and you have a client, usually a public authority, and I can understand it. I don't have the technical sheet. I don't have a guarantee that this product might be adapted. So I'm not going to take the risk. As an architect, that's things that I do as an architect. I have, I don't know exact, exact, exactly what your responsibilities are as a, an architect in the United Kingdom, 
but where we live, basically we're responsible for everything for a long time. So anything goes wrong, they come over to the architect's office. So if I decide to work with reclaimed building materials, I, in terms of insurance, also have to make sure that I know what I'm doing. But once that I do think that I know what I'm doing, I think the client should go along with it. So I'm happy my clients usually do, but public authorities still have a problem with, I don't have the documentation, so I'm not going to take the risk. In the best case, they can, they say, okay, you have some wash, reclaimed wash basins, this we will use. But the bricks or the roof tiles, we won't because it's too dangerous. So if we had these passports, it would make things a lot easier in terms of legal guarantee and, and insurance. So but how do you building site. With, with the move to going to buildings more as material banks and the whole reuse, how do you see the balance about around integrating new technologies, new innovations, new products with then reusing the existing materials from older buildings? How do you find that balance? Do you mean new products in terms of building materials or is it wider than broader? Than I think it's from a fabric approach, actually, because it's quite easy from a, an HVAC or an energy perspective, you can obviously replacing gas boilers with a heat pump yeah. or is a good solution and an easier thing to do. But especially from a fabric level, we've spoken to a lot of people on this podcast that are coming out now with their decarbonizing concrete and cements. They're coming out with insulations that are using nanogels. And there's a huge now raft of new fabric materials. And I just wonder how we balance that with the reuse and circularity side of things. Regarding retrofit and so the revolution as well, obviously with the existing building stock, the main issue will be on insulation of the building envelope and yeah, replacing of windows, for example, and then alongside that you will have the technical installations. Uh, in Brussels, let's say most of the residential buildings are made out. I live in one like this. It dates from 1902 and we have very thick brick walls, which were mounted with a different mortar than the one we use today. And I am currently working on seeing how I can insulate the, the building on the side of the street. And then I already hit a first barrier because from a city planning level, I can't add any thickness on that side. So I have to do it from the inside. So if I have to insulate on the inside, but then again, that sets me. I want to make sure that my building envelope can still breathe. So I'm not going to look at nanomaterials in my case. I'm going to look for bio-based materials, for example, wood fiber or maybe cellulose and things like that. The thing is that I, what well, it's very interesting with the existing building stock in Brussels is that you have this issue of, okay, we, if you want to create an airtight envelope, you will have to make very sure that there's no risk of condensation, that your vapor can migrate and so on, yeah. which almost immediately brings you to looking at building at building materials like hemp or wood fiber or cellulose, or in some cases cork, even if it's an expensive one. So more natural fiber-based materials rather than the ones that don't, that just block your, your water vapors. I like this because for me, it's some, let's more or less going back to basics or common sense we had this movement you probably had this well in the 1970s 80s when we started to think about insulating buildings oh let's do this with the petrochemical foams and a lot of people consider these to be the traditional materials and then let's say hemp or straw bales i have some co-housing project with straw bales i built but in the south of the country they say, oh, that's experimental. Are we sure that this works? But a lot of these <laughs> things are actually ancestral. It's like lime plaster or rammed earth or stuff. And there's just supposed to be like new waves. Some people think, oh, this is Woodstock, which is coming over very people high on something. And I'm not sure that they know what they're doing. But actually, there's a lot of more experience with these materials historically than with the more modern ones, which we tend to trust more for some mm -hmm. strange reason. I'm not sure that harking back to the 1980s for spray foam insulation is that far off current practice today in the UK, to be quite honest with you, Lisbeth. So I think, and I totally agree with you in the, this, this renaissance, albeit surprising in terms of it going and coming back, 
with bio-based materials and the focus on hemp. We speak to Tom Wally quite a lot and his work around hemp and hempcrete has been really influential. One of the things that, first off, check out a company called Thermulon because they're making a, a nanoporous aerogel product using waste glass and waste silica. Uh, okay, I don't know that one. And it'll give you a really low buildup internally for a retrofit project that's still able to manage moisture. Oh. We've had those guys on the podcast before and they're a regular at Future Build. The, uh, you probably would have met them when you were there. The other thing is, we usually wrap this podcast up asking people about their vision for the future. But since we've been looking at this long-term 100-year plan, I'm going to throw this at you totally unprepared, so forgive me. Mm. What is your vision? What is the vision that we need to be achieving for 100 years' time? It could be anything along the lines of, I don't want to pay for energy anymore. And then how do we get there in 50 years time in terms of the path that we take? And then what do we need to do immediately to set out on that? So let's start with that long-term aspiration for a hundred years time beyond our lifetimes. Where do you want Brussels to be? Where do you want the world to be at that point? Oh, that's a difficult one. The example you gave, I don't want to pay for energy anymore. I'm, I don't have a problem with paying for the things I consume or use. So it would be unfair to say I use things and I don't pay for them. Mm -hmm. But the question of resource efficiency and resilience in that term, I think, is an inevitable one. We can't go around that. If we want to achieve these goals around the globe, on a European level, on a national level, on a local level, that's where we have to put the focus. One thing that I hope we will achieve is that we will get everyone on board, as I said, all the professionals as well as on a social level, everyone. And that it shouldn't be for the happy few. And regarding this revolution and renovation wave, one, one issue I currently see is that we consider every building as one object. I live where I live, and then I have a neighbor to the left and a label to neighbor to the right and somewhere in front. I live in an existing building from 100 and so years ago. They do too in my street. Some of the technologies which are very easy to implement in new buildings or bigger buildings, like, for example, let's say heat pumps, are a lot more difficult to integrate in an existing building fabric. I don't have a garden. My neighbors don't either. So I have a small terrace and next door, everything is built up. So I can't do this. What I'm hoping for is that there's this movement is gaining a little bit of, of speed in Brussels, but I think we should speed it up is that we should think on a community level about how we can produce renewable energy on a larger scale than taking every building in the street and every apartment in this building individually. That, to me, is not resource efficient to start with. You really easily hit the limitations of your existing building stock. And I think we also, again, need the public authorities in there. We have a huge amount of roofs or some open spaces which belong to the public where we have opportunities for generating renewable energy, which we could redistribute to the neighborhoods. I think that's the only feasible way to have also re reduce the costs, the investment cost, because it probably won't make sense to invest in each of these apartments separately. I don't think on the long, in the long run you can do this. So we really have to think together on a larger scale and not consider everything separately. And that also applies again on a larger level, as you said, if the World Green Building Council is reflecting on this, it is indeed absolutely necessary. You don't want to end up in a situation like the one you mentioned as, okay, we're not going to build there because they have too many rules. We just go around it and build. We should have similar at the same, ba same baseline, same principles. So there's a lot of things going on the European level on, on that. It's a building site in itself. You have the construction products regulation, which is up for revision. You have the EPB recast, you have the Green Deal, you have the United Nation, Nations with their objectives. Of course, there's a lot of lobbying and let's hope that yeah. the lobbying that pays out is the right one, which with a focus for equal opportunities for everyone to 
indeed get involved and and not be left out. That's always a gamble, of course, but we do need... The framework won't always be exactly the same everywhere, of course. You can't compare a context, let's say, a building somewhere on the African continent in a completely different climate, but we need a baseline that we share. But I guess what you're saying is uh, is that 100-year point, that vision, that aspiration, is that actually globally we are far more aligned in our understanding of resource use, in our understanding of resource reuse, in the global markets reflect that there are no safe havens for unsustainable activity. And I think I'd love to think that's something that we could achieve globally as a planet within 50 years, but that might be a bit of a pipe dream. And I really like you winding back to what do we do now? And actually, yeah, it's more about what are the solutions at a community level and how do we get public authorities and local government to start really embedding community-focused solutions around some of these really big challenges. So I think they're absolutely fantastic points to end on, Lisbeth, and thanks so much for your time today. It's been absolutely phenomenal to speak to you. Thank you. I hope it's, it was interesting. I, I, I feel a little bit awkward because we still, again, we're from a extremely small country on the other side of the <laughs> channel. <laughs> I no, just wanted no, to ask, uh, cool. add something to this getting everyone on board. I'm a big fan. I grew up with Monty Python, but I'm also a big fan of Eddie Izzard. And in one of his shows, which dates back to, let's say, at least 20 years ago, you, maybe you've seen it. It's called Dress to Kill. And at one point, people in Wales, he's ex- mimicking them, people in Wales just going, carving out in the stone pieces for Stonehenge. And they're talking and they're saying, oh, yeah, it's going to be the most beautiful henge we've ever built. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's nice. The Druids really know what they're doing. And then he says, nobody had a clue what a henge was, but they're still doing it. The thing is that we all need to do, need to know what the henge is before we start carving these stones. So it made me think about this, the Izzard sketch and the Stonehenge thing. Let's get everyone aboard and know what we're doing to a common objective. Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll be watching on the other side of the channel. <laughs> Oliver, what I would say is, yeah, Elizabeth is a true net zero pioneer. I mean, we touched on so many important topics there. We talked about design and disassembly. We talked about that holistic approach to sustainable construction. I mean, they're an amazing resource to have for any you know Brussels-based architectural practice. Oh, mate, they, these guys are a powerhouse of progress behind uh, the Brussels political scene and strategy around sustainability. I mean. One of the things that they do, which we really don't do, and actually we talk about all of the time, is the fact that we have such a massive skills deficit. The fact that we not only have the people, but we don't have the training, we don't have the education resources in the UK at the minute to hit where we really need to hit in terms of reducing carbon emissions um, and achieving the Paris Agreement. Now, these guys have been working in that education space for over a decade, um, working with clients, working with industry, to help them understand, meet, and engage with the really progressive and um, forward-thinking strategy and leadership from the 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 sustainable construction side of of Brussels. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think you know. I think for me, it's just her passion that sh- that shone through as well. I think. You know, she's a Brianna Setha, uh, she's an architect, um, she's got an in-depth knowledge from, you know, on the engineering side as well. Um, yeah, I think, you know, everyone we seem to get at the moment on Future X has a real passion for what they do, and I think that always really shines through. They, these guys have got, you know, Lisa, that's a really good example, is the depth of knowledge is, is, is so vast and experience because they've been doing it for 15 years you know we start talking to her about the fact that we're now building passive house schools and as you say these guys have been doing that for 15 years you know that they they, they've been so progressive and so ahead of the curve that they're easily 10 years ahead of the uk in terms of um, strategy and policy um so here's an idea why don't we just get these guys over to talk to some of our politicians about net zero futures and whole city retrofit Absolutely. I think I'm just touching on the retrofit point. You know, Brussels have to do it because they don't have the land to, you know, to build new housing, you know. And in the UK, yeah, you know, we're trying to build 
yeah, whatever target, you know, 300,000 homes a year, um, you know, nowhere getting near that. But we've got a massive retrofit problem. And you're absolutely right. Brussels are becoming the leading experts at that. Kind of, you know, hark back to the episode that we did with Indy, uh, Indy Johar, Dark Matter Labs. You know, we need a real sort of systems thinking approach to the way that we address this as an industry. It has to be entirely inclusive of some really progressive political leadership. And it needs probably Branton Root Roof reform in terms of our approach we have to think differently about how we're going to achieve a more sustainable future because we can't build those three hundred thousand homes you know indy's indy's team have done the math you know we can achieve maybe nine thousand maybe nineteen thousand at the top end of the scale depending on how they're built according to the team at dark matter labs so we need all of these thinkers in one space, which is why, again, I think FutureX is so important and why um, particularly this year, I think that the energy in at Future Build with all of these thinkers in one space was was absolutely um, mind-blowing. Absolutely, absolutely. And actually, if you enjoyed the sessions or want to see the sessions, they're now all on demand via our collab platform. You can visit futurebuild.co.uk and see that. Most importantly, if you enjoyed this podcast, please share and subscribe. And we'll be back very soon with more guests. Join our community to stay up to date with all things FutureX. Visit futurebuild.co.uk to sign up. Please also like them and share them to help grow our community. You can subscribe to the podcasts within your favourite podcast platform. Thanks so much for listening and we hope you'll be back again soon.